Hello everyone and welcome to the first of a series of lectures on research appraisal. We're going to be looking at how to improve your research, how to present it well, how research is judged, particularly when research proposals are submitted for funding calls, and we're going to be looking at the mechanics and the processes of evaluating research uh, when it is first conceived and also when it is completed and uh, delivered to a public or uh, to those who commissioned it. So let's start by introducing the concept of research appraisal. Appraisal is an act of addressing the formal assessment of a piece of work uh, so that we know what its qualities are, whether it's any good, whether it's functional, whether it works, and so on. And it is, of course, absolutely universal in science. In fact, science relies on peer review. So what is research appraisal? Well, research appraisal basically involves funding proposals for research projects. Um, there are also other proposals, for example, for funding a research unit and also the evaluation of the finished product, which would mostly be in the form of papers and manuscripts. Uh, now, they could come out in the form of a book or a journal article or a report, and any of these might need appraising, and the process of appraisal should be a positive one where we look to the strengths of the piece of work, and we also look to how its weaknesses could be improved, and this can be a learning process for all concerned. So research appraisal involves critical evaluations, for example, of presentations or of written material, and it can also involve the appraisal of the people who are delivering the research, uh, for example, appraisal of personnel, which would be based upon an evaluation of their life history, that is to say their curriculum vitae, and their research output in whatever form it has been given in. So research appraisal is essentially about evaluating all aspects of research in order to improve the uh, the doing and the delivery of research uh, so that uh, we all can learn from the process. What do we look for in appraisal? Well, because we're dealing here with science, we look for reproducibility. In other words, could a scientific experiment or a set of conclusions from an analysis be repeated? In other words, is the work objective? Will it work in terms of logic? and is it reasonable, consistent, and also, does it have novelty? We're all engaged in the process of driving forward the frontiers of science, perhaps rather modestly, but nevertheless, that is what we're out to do. So we need to look at research in terms of, does it merely repeat the work of the past, or does it, in fact, give us something give us something new uh, and ensure that the frontiers of science are, however slightly, pushed forward. Now, to do that adequately, you also need rigour. In other words, that all relevant aspects of the problem have been considered and dealt with, and that the work itself is, if you like, watertight. In other words, it's something that will stand the test of time and also the test of evaluation. Now, there may be errors and misassumptions in research, and these also need to be called to attention and highlighted, and also lessons need to be learned from any errors and misassumptions. Finally, we need to think about relevance, especially in these days where research is often very critically evaluated in terms of what benefit it is to society. Especially where research costs money, and indeed it all does, then it is necessary to consider how relevant is the research to the needs of society. So we often talk about pathways to impact. In other words, what impact is the research likely to have? Will it improve conditions somewhere and somehow? But in order to evaluate relevance, we also need to consider relevance to what? So we need to define the context in which we are evaluating the relevance in order to decide whether something actually is relevant. 
Now, there are problems in this process. For example, one of them is that really not a great deal is original. It is often said that more scientists are living today than have ever existed in the past. In fact, science has gone through enormous growth in the last 100 to 50 years, and therefore very much is being done. So one upshot of that is not much is actually very original. And moreover, people are under pressure to produce work, um, and the work that they produce may or may not be um, um, unusual, particular, novel, original, um, and, and that is particularly a problem where the pressures on people induce them to cut corners. Now, there are in science a few bad eggs, in other words, people who would defraud, plagiarise, uh, pillage other people's work, pass off someone else's work as their own, and this sort of thing. Fortunately, there are very few of them, but one of the tasks of research appraisal is to try to ensure that uh, such work is identified and uh, called out uh, so that we can try to guarantee that research is done in good faith and that it is of good quality. There is in modern science a relentless pressure to produce, always to do more research, always to publish more. And this has resulted, if one reads the academic journals, for example, in huge increases in apparent productivity. But is it quality or is it quantity? Of course, we would like it to be both. In other words, that there is an increase in the number of papers published, the amount of research done but that the quality of it is very high. So one of, the, uh, one of the tasks of research appraisal is to try to ensure that we identify good quality and we induce the producers of research to improve their quality and always to aim for high quality. The next question then is how do we appraise? Uh, well, there are a number of appropriate questions here, the first of which is, if you're dealing with a work, is it good science? Well, to answer that question, we need to define what we mean by good science. Uh, perhaps we mean something that is uh, well written and where there is a sense of rigour in the methodology and where questions are answered and where if one has doubts about the research, they are easily countered by good arguments. So one way of finding that out is to look at the work and ask firstly and foremost, is it logical and consistent? Do the arguments follow each other? Now, one would have to develop criteria for that. So in the process of appraisal, uh, there is much emphasis on one's experience. An experienced appraiser can judge almost intuitively whether a work is logical, consistent, and therefore good quality. A final question is, is the work good value for money? If this is the response to a call for funding and a project has been funded, then those who fund it, or perhaps merely the taxpayer, those who contribute to the process of research funding, would want to be reassured that what is going on is good quality and that therefore there is value for money. So that might be one of the criteria applied when research is appraised. When we get down to the nitty gritty of it, is there anything new in the work? Compared to what has been published and produced in the past, is there anything different about this project? And does it indeed drive forward those frontiers of science? On reading the work, on looking at what has been produced, are there evident mistakes in it? Are there misassumptions in the research? Is there something that can be called out as not logical, not consistent, not appropriate? Now, to be sure that the appraisal is good work, then the appraiser needs to be objective. To an extent, none of us are totally objective because we all have our life experiences behind us and we all have our likes and dislikes. But when we appraise, we need to make a special effort to firstly think that the person who produced the work was probably acting in very good faith and doing the best that he or she could do. Therefore, it isn't entirely fair to be harsh on someone who has done his or her best. And it is very important to try to be objective about the strengths and the weaknesses of the work in question. 
And this is all the more true when one thinks about the impact of one's judgment. For example, good researchers can be discouraged by harsh criticism, especially if it is unduly harsh. They may or they may not recognise, they may or they may not agree with what is being said in these cases. But really, if they're doing the work in good faith and if they're striving to the best of their abilities, it perhaps isn't a good idea to discourage them by overly harsh criticism. Hence the importance of objectivity. At the same time, it is also important that if there is something wrong with the work, then this be drawn attention to. There is a pressure on the producer of the research and on the person who appraises it, and the first pressure is lack of time, in that we're all induced to do more and more in less and less time, and therefore there is a temptation to skimp either on the work or on the appraisal. And also there is a sense of competitivity in as much as we're all keep competing for funds or for good grades or for successful appraisals and so on. And uh, all of this takes its toll on people. We're, after all, only human and we can only manage so much. One thing that one has to be aware of when doing appraisals is whether one is dealing with work that is strictly within one's own competency, in other words, one's own training and experience, or whether, in fact, the research is outside that. Now, if one is appraising something that's not within one's competency, then it's a very good idea simply to think about it and to um, make it clear that the viewpoint that you're expressing is that of an outsider. And that can be useful because much research in the modern age has to appeal not merely to those who are strictly within the field, one's peers and the experts and so on, but also to those who are outside the field. So there is often a strong element of communication in research. Is it communicating with people who perhaps are not absolute experts in the field and perhaps don't have that uh, tremendous familiarity with the concepts and the terminology and so on. So in this sense, uh, an outsider's view can be useful, although one has to be careful because there is a risk that through lack of familiarity with the field, one could make mistakes in appraising it. And lastly, we try to avoid bias in appraisals. Bias is created by a sense of um, uh, likes and dislikes and uh, whether one is um, ideologically opposed to things or not. And we have to be fairly self-aware when we appraise research and try to ensure that what we do is not biased and that we free ourselves from the sense of bias that comes from particular preconceptions about the way things should be done. Now, when one is an editor and one sends out scientific work for appraisal by referees, which we do because the referee system is the gold standard of scientific publication, then we try to get three reviews of a piece of work. Very often we content ourselves with two reviews if they are detailed and honest enough and if there is at least some semblance of a consensus on the value and the publishability of the work in question. Let's assume, though, that we manage to get three reviews. Now, most reviewers are convinced that their opinion of the work is the right opinion, perhaps the only opinion on the work, but it is remarkable how often the editor will find in front of himself or herself three reviews that are really quite different in style and in conclusion. For example, the first review may say, this is a great piece of work, excellent, you can publish it just as it is, it doesn't need modifying. The second reviewer instead might take a much darker view and say, oh, it's fundamentally flawed, the methodology is plain wrong, there are errors all over the place, you should reject this paper. Well, if you have two reviews like that, then you clearly need a third one in order to settle the differences. And the third reviewer might say, well, it's basically a good piece of work, but it needs substantial improvement because it's got this flaw and that problem and this inconsistency and so on. 
And uh, what do we do then? Well, the usual editorial response to that would be to write to the author with copies of the reviews, usually anonymously provided, and say, well, look, you've got to address the criticisms as far as you can. And the author will probably write back and say, OK, I will send you a revised version as soon as possible in which I answer the criticisms as best I can. Now, it's often impossible to answer criticisms which are absolutely damning. This is a flawed piece of work. There's nothing that can be done with it, except perhaps to make a case that perhaps the reviewer is wrong. I have been a journal editor for some 34 years and I've always taken the view that an author has as much right to an opinion as a reviewer does, even if the reviewer is very much the expert. So in that sense, it's the editor's job to reconcile diverse views of a piece of work. It is perhaps part of the human condition that we do have these diverse views, and it's also not unusual because you can often view a piece of scientific work from a variety of different angles that will give you a different take on it and give you different opinions about it. So it's perfectly possible for a piece of work, once evaluated, to demonstrate that it is good in certain ways but not so good in other ways. And most pieces of work indeed can be improved uh, thanks to the advice, we hope it is kindly advice, by those who have appraised it. Now, reviewing presentations is something that you might have to do, and uh, indeed it is an important and useful skill. In so doing, well, we look at this in another presentation in a little more detail, but to summarise broadly what needs to be done and said. Firstly, you have a speaker in front of you. Is the person articulate? Does the person know how to put over the concepts that he or she has in mind to tell you about? Is the talk comprehensible? Which means, firstly, is it logical? Does it have a narrative progression? Does it start at the beginning pass through the middle and end at the end. Um, now that seems very obvious, but I have been to many talks in my life where they do not do that and in fact are pretty much of a muddle. So the balance of sections and the order of things and the way that the argument is presented, hopefully in an orderly progression, is really quite important. Presentations are a means of communication. Communication means getting ideas across, and we would hope that that is done in a fairly worthwhile way. Behind all of this, of course, there's also the fact that we need to have research that is good. In other words, it's worth putting over. And the talker, the speaker, therefore, has a sense of conviction, a sense that what he or she is saying is worthwhile. And there's nothing uh, like enthusiasm for spicing up a presentation so that those who listen to it uh, are carried along with it and, and feel that there really is something in this work and, and uh, the enthusiasm is, as it were, contagious, it's infectious. And also, is the research appropriate to present? There is a growing fashion to present um, papers on what we will do or what we would do when we get the money or if we had the money. I don't think that that is a good idea. I would like to see what they have done when they finish the project, project, not what they intend to do before they start. But such is the pressure on people to speak at conferences and give presentations that unfortunately we also have this phenomenon. So, Perhaps there are visual aids. In fact, in science, most speakers employ visual aids, just as I am doing right now, uh, partly because they help the audience to remember things and the audience perhaps can obtain a copy of the visual aids and go back and look at them, and partly because sometimes it's necessary to explain things with the aid of audio graphics, for example, by speaking to a diagram or a picture uh, that will uh, explain what is going on, especially where the concepts are perhaps rather complicated. So are the visual aids well presented? Is the timing good? Are they easy to see? Is the writing large? Are there things on the slides that you can't make out from a distance? That is not a good thing when it happens, but it's all too common. And finally, is there a good take-home message? so that when you come out of the auditorium having listened to the speaker, you remember something of what he or she said, and you could refer back to perhaps published material. You could even make your own appraisals of it. And the 
talk, the presentation has, as far as you, member of the audience, are concerned, been worthwhile. So that's all for now, and we conclude on the first of these talks, and we will now move on to the uh, meat of the matter, a series of talks on the different aspects of appraising research. Thank you.